Thank you very much for being here. Uh, it's amazing me in Asia bringing our experience. So um, I'm, I'm not here to give lectures about how you can set up an organization. We had a workshop. Yes, it was very interesting uh, having a discussion on that. Today, I just would like to tell you about my experience. So there's one thing that I've learned in the last years, and that this is what I want to talk about. So maybe this, I think this is very important for all of us, so I would like to share it. So this is me. Uh, you can find me around the web, of course. My name is Stelio Verzera, and uh, I, I, ha I have a problem. I've tried to explain to my parents what I do for a living for the last 20 years. And probably they're starting to get it now. The, the thing is actually my job kept changing, as I guess most of yours. So I started working uh, when internet arrived to Europe. I was like 18 or 19 while I started. And uh, at that time, um, uh, sorry, I need to have also a timer. So I have the time. So at that time, uh, um, it was something for IT people, for geeks. But the company started to see it as a strategic asset. And that's what I started doing, helping them using, making something out of this new tool. Then things kept changing, and dynamics that internet brought in started changing the markets. The information processing power, the power shifted from big players, a few big players, to the public. And so I set up my first company when I was 24, 25. So this is on, I kept following this change. And just now connecting the dots back, I can understand what I've been doing. And there are two ways of saying that. So the first way is that actually I've been helping uh, companies in their evolution since I was 19. Um, the second way to say that probably is more realistic is that I've been causing new troubles to organizations. So my job is helping them move from the current troubles to new troubles to face. So this is why if you look for me on LinkedIn, um, I'm, I set myself up as a professional troublemaker. And I think that's what still a lot of us do. So I would like this line to introduce one of the two people that, is, that are going to help me in this, through this talk, which is Marshall McLuhan. Who knows Marshall McLuhan? Please raise your hands. All right, Marshall McLuhan is a visionary that foresee the global village in the 60s. He became famous for, well, he was famous in the academic environment, but he became famous on the mainstream for an article that he published, uh, an interview of him that's been published on Playboy in 1969. So he's quite a genius. Um, he is the author of the quote, the medium is the message, which might, you might have heard around. So Marshall McLuhan said that every society honors its life, life conformists and its dead troublemakers. I don't know about honors. I'm for sure I'm alive at the moment, and I'm causing a lot of trouble. So this is a lot about trouble again. I had this company that I founded in 24, uh, when I was 24 hours, 24 years old. And uh, we went quite good on the markets for eight years, like international uh, customers. We worked with Land Rover, uh, airplane manufacturing, local customers as well. It went quite good for a while. And uh, what we were doing uh, today, we might, well, at the time it was called uh, innovation in marketing. Actually, we were developing conversation between the companies and their sta external stakeholders using the new media. Then uh, you might hear heard about the crisis that hit the whole world, and for sure Italy. And in 2010, this is how my company turned out. We crashed it, simply. And uh, there was my first company. I had put like almost 10 years of my life in there. And I spent one of the worst summers of my life like this. My wife, who she's here, knows better. Now, the problem is not you're losing a company. The problem is that it tackles your identity. It tackles what you think about yourself. And you start asking yourself, what, I, what, I did, what did I do wrong and what I maybe did do right? Fortunately, I wasn't alone in that. We had launched that company with a couple of other 
people. Actually, we were already tired of using our nights to help Land Rover with all the respect selling their cars or airplane manufacturers selling their airplanes. We were feeling the need to creating real value for people. So actually, this was a chance to stop and reflect on what we wanted to be in the next phase of, li of our lives. Of course, my parents, I was, I don't know, I was 30, probably 30 something. My parents were pushing for finding me a job. Said, okay, now it's time you find a job. What you have done is not having a job. No, you, you have a company, a lot of risk. This is also a common way of thinking in Italy. I know that maybe in the United States can be different, but in Italy, they want you to be safe. Actually, I have never ever looked for a job. I have never looked, I have never been through a job interview, actually once or twice, but I was curious about the company. I wasn't looking for the job. So when we stopped, we asked ourselves, oh, so what is it that we have done good? And there were two things that we were working on already with the last company, our previous one. And when I, we decided that we wanted to create a new company, we wanted to take those two things with us to create value. So one thing was the concept of the value stream. So you might have heard about lean thinking, lean management. Who knows about lean? Please raise your hands so I get the feeling. All right, so I don't have to tell you that this is all about streamlining your value creation and taking waste of muda out of it. We loved this way of thinking and we started understanding that not all companies are created to generate value. There are other reasons why people uh, run companies, like creating career, career paths, distributing pow power. It's tricky, but we wanted to focus on value creation. Second thing, beyond the lean thinking body of knowledge from Taishi Ono to Agile, actually, was the body of knowledge of open collaboration which is merging value streams in order to create something that is way beyond the sum of the individual parts, something that is organic on its own. We were working in this, actually we were doing this for our customers, and we thought, now, okay, this is something that we want to build into our new company. So before I tell you what happened, let me step a little bit back and give you a background of what were our reflections. Don't worry, not till the Egyptians. This slide is to introduce what happened in the last century, which you probably already know, so I will be quite uh, fast on that. So after Taylor uh, virtually invented modern management, dividing people that think in a company from people that do, that execute, we've been designing companies for one century for them in order to be durable, stable, and predictable. That was possible because the structure of the markets in the last century had a very low complexity. Few players, like 1% of the players, controlled the dynamics of 99% of the markets. And so the variability was quite low. You could, in the 70s, you could foresee the future of your company for 10 or 15 years and have a plan on that. Now it looks crazy. 10 years from now is going to be science fiction. And uh, literally. So this thing generated some organization that actually was well designed. There is a, a big body of knowledge about organization design in order to be durable, stable, and predictable. The thing is when crisis hit, we've seen all of our customers, including the big ones, and ourselves completely unable to adapt to what was changing at that rate. Because we had started, since we've been with our small company, we had been eight or nine years on the market, we had started to structure ourselves. And the more we structure ourselves, the less adaptive we were able to be. Actually, this thing was creating quite a few problems all over the world. And this was foreseen from, by the other person I want to introduce, which is Peter Drucker, who knows Peter Drucker, please raise your hands. Okay, so I will not say a thing about him. This is the beginning of a nice book, which is the Post-Capitalist Society. And he says that every few hundred years in Western history, there occurs a sharp transformation, 
Within a few short decades, society rearranged itself. 50 years later, there is a new world, and the people born there cannot even imagine the world in which their grandparents lived and into which their own parents were born. We are currently living through such a transformation. And he wrote this in the 90s. So this is a transformation that now we, it's mainstream. We all have recognized, just a few ones recognized it in the 90s, like Peter Drucker. That's why he's a, I mean, he's a, like a lighthouse for management. And this transformation is probably going to finish in the 20s or 30s, leaving us with a completely different world. So what happened is that everything we have worked with just collapsed. And this created a few set of consequences. So the first one on the job in, in companies, these are numbers from Gallup, 20, I think 2013 research, the um, global workplace. And 89% is the number of people found unengaged at work. This is, these numbers are from uh, Western Europe, okay? 89% disengaged, of which 26% actively disengaged. So disengaged means that these people basically go to work just because they need money. Actively disengaged, they don't, they don't care about the company that much, but if they're actively disengaged, they're trying to contrast the company and the other workers uh, anytime they can because they are hungry with the company. Um, by the way, these are the numbers for India. So almost they're a little worse, okay? This is available. So this is the first consequence. Then you might have heard also of the Occupy movement, uh, Arab Spring. So this kind of thinking that is for the first time after more than a century, finding out that it, uh, leaving 1% of the people uh, planning and controlling the life and work of 99% of the people simply didn't work anymore. Now, it's not a matter of being wrong or right, just not effective anymore. It doesn't work today, and there are quite a good, good reason, it's, and basically it's that complexity is back very high in the, in the markets. So not just companies, but the whole arena, the whole society is suffering from a, a no longer effective structuring of our organization, including governments, unfortunately. Of course, there are also nice things that are happening because of this big change. For the first time, people can organize themselves without central control. And that's true for a tsunami like it happened over here in 2004. It's true for what happened in Paris with the um, terrorism attack. So people can really do things without any central control, self-organizing, before the Red Cross, before the governments, giving aid, sending money, amazing and very useful things. This is the first time we're able to do this, and this is the first time in human history where a problem can be raised in Africa, discussed in the United States, and solved in Asia in three weeks. This is amazing. So this was the reflection we had done, and we stopped and said, okay, we want to start a new company but we wanted to be ready for this scenario. We wanted to be very different. We don't need it to be adaptable, uh, sorry, durable and predictable. We need it to be adaptive and anti-fragile. Now, there is a talk, I think Naresh is having it today, I don't know if Naresh is in the room, uh, about anti-fragility. So I don't want to spoil it. I will just say that this is a quote from uh, uh, Nicholas Nassim Taleb book with the same title, Antifragile. He's the author of The Black Swan, so you might know him for The Black Swan. I prefer this book. What he says is that uh, we usually build robust or resilient things to resist change, but we can go much farther and build things that thrive with change. So the more change you throw at them, the stronger they become. So this is what we wanted to build, and we embraced what if thinking. And it's easy when you lost everything, you say, okay, I want to start new, and if I start new, I want to do it my way. So we said, what if we can build a company in which values and principles can stand in the place of roles and titles? And when I say this, I say it in the sense of the Agile Manifesto. It doesn't mean that the other things are not important, but we want 
to overcome the importance of those with values and principles radically. And engagement can stand in the place of command and empowerment in the place of control. So how would uh, such a company be? It was 2011. We were like crazy people. Everybody was saying, you're crazy. This is not doable. It's impossible to build something like this because we were already having an idea how that could be. But job contracts and whatever normal thinking about a company were against this way of thinking. We came out with something that I will, not go into, I will not go into too much. We called it liquid organization, and liquido is the short name for that. Liquido is uh, an Italian word. It means liquid. But it stand, also stands for liquid organization. You can find it in details. We have released the white paper on liquidorganization.info, and you find information. We will update it over time. It's in Creative Commons. And I want to make clear that we do not sell this. The job of my company is another one. Okay, so we did this for ourselves, and then we released it for the world. And doing this, we brought something, something to the world that integrated lean thinking, open collaboration, and positive psychology at work as body of knowledge. We didn't invent much. We put things together in the simplest, simplest form we could think of. We wanted a DNA, something that had some basic and simple rules in order to generate complex and healthy behaviors. So we have a collaborative working board, which is, which is uh, a Kanban board that I guess all of you know here. So it's a board where the whole governance of the company is visible and accessible by anybody. Anybody can propose things in our governance. And when I say anybody, we embrace this so radically that we don't, we, we let also customers, partners, internal, uh, external people into the governance of our company. We have customers that take part in the governance of our company as well. On that working board, there is a contribution accounting system running, which allow people to have a granular and continuous flow of feedback on how much they are contributing to the governance. This is not a performance measurement. Performance uh, is, a, is a, an egotic metric. It's about how, you, how well you're doing. This is about how well you're helping others. Okay, contribution in the governance items. And it's continuous, so you get it small and continuously, like one per week, or it depends on the length of the work items. When it's finished, you get a, you get a contribution retrospective uh, evaluation. With that value that you get, the more value the other recognized you're creating, the more decisional power you get in the governance. The owners of our company, including myself, do not have a say in decisions if they're not creating value recognized by the others in the governance. We have a toolbox of collaborative decision-making tools, which include the positional decision-making. Of course, what has been done for 100 years is still in place, so we can still have somebody be the, the only person that can take that decision, but not for the role but for the competencies of that person. We can say, guy, you have to take this decision. But at the side of that, we have a complete tools. We've spoken like two hours yesterday about this in the workshop of collaborative decision-making uh, processes. Okay? This run into the board. So one work item in the governance can be a decision. And anybody can join that. And the team that is taking that decision chooses the decision process they want to have for that one. And it's the smallest one that should do the job. Then we execute, we get feedback, and if it's needed, we rechange the decision. If we feel it is a big decision, we use a more structured decision-making process. Okay? We have a toolbox. Last part, reputation tracking. This is simply showing what you are doing or what you are not doing in the governance. So the reputation that we are tracking, in, tracking is not a political reputation. Actually, it is an operational reputation. So it's about how much value the others are giving you, how much you are taking part to, to, to the uh, work items in the governance, and so on. This allows establishing what is in nature is called stigmergy, which is the ability to act on the signs left by the action of others around you. So if you, for example, uh, enter the governance of our company, you can have a look and see who is doing what, and you know who to ask for, and you know who's into the governance 
or, and who is just there maybe talking a lot, not doing anything, okay? We are social animals and reputation for us is very important. This is important to align the interest of the person with the interest of the group, simply because it shows, okay? This is a way of implementing radical transparency as well. We use this system to drop job interviews completely. We let people into our company through the governance. You wanna work with us? Enter the governance, do things. Then you will decide if that's the, the place for you to be or leaving. So this is it for Liquido. I just want to tell you that the most important thing about Liquido is not Liquido, is the fact that since 2011, Liquido has brought us into a wave of incredible change all around the world. We just found us to be a drop in this way. There are a million things. We are connected with people doing such things in Israel, in New Zealand, in the United States, other parts of Europe. Some are hacking and tweaking our jobs. Some others are doing companies on a blockchain. It's, what is happening today is amazing in this respect. Humanity is finding the need for a new tool to be organized. That tool is what we call organizations. The thing is we're disrupting this tool. We need it completely different because the environment has changed. So, who knows those two guys? I don't know if a uh, motorbike is, is followed here in India. Maybe somebody from the United States. Nothing, oh yes, thank you very much. So this guy over here on the left is Valentino Rossi, Italian, I'm sorry, but he's like the most famous motors, motorbike driver all uh, around the world. He's, he's won everything. This other guy here on the right is uh, Mark Marquez, Spanish. Now, three years ago, what happened after that Valentino Rossi was, was finishing every race with like 500 me meters distance from the second, so winning alone, this guy, like 18 years old, came up and he started leaving Valentino the same amount of distance when finishing. So everybody was like, what the hell is going on here? And also Valentino was like, this is not possible. I mean, I, this is not just, you know, racing with me for the final line. It's completely deleting me from, from the line. What was happening is that uh, Marcus had intuitively found a way of driving the same technology that in that case was the bike that was defying any knowledge of, of physics. And I'm an aerospace engineer. So he was driving at like 170 kilometers per hour in a band completely out of the bike sliding. And that was, th was thought to be almost impossible, at least as a normal behavior. It happened sometime. Now, to cut it short, Valentino could have said, okay, I am the champion. I don't care about how he drives. I will improve my driving and I will get him back. The thing actually happened on the other way around. Valentino said, I need to drive like this guy. After he has been for 20 years the un unbeaten champion, he said, I need to do what he's doing. Otherwise, I'm out of the game. And he also knew that he was different. He was taller. He couldn't drive in the same way with the same angle. So he adapted what Marcus was doing. He went back to challenging Marcus and finally he won a game. Now this is exactly what is happening today with companies. There is a new way to drive the technology that is companies. There are some big players that are understanding this and are adapting the way they drive their companies. Some others aren't and probably they are set to decline as it's already happening. But another thing about this story is this was on Inside Motorcycles on 2013. Like most top riders exploring the other limits of riding skill and technique, Marquez himself is not able to fully explain his riding style. So the thing is, this guy actually didn't know what he was doing. He interviewed, he said, well, I don't know, I just, I know that I should drive it in a more clean way, but when I have to win, I forget it and I win in another way. This is what is happening uh, with, with companies like ours. When we started in 2011, we actually didn't know what we were doing. We learned it on the way. And this is why in our first white paper, you don't find many tips on how to implement a liquid organization, because we simply didn't know. 
we were doing it, but we didn't know how it worked and how it could work for other companies. What we did, we identified these three dimensions in the space of evolution for a company, which are leanness, openness, and inclusiveness. So the leanness is about how people collaborate in a new way. Inclusiveness is how people craft direction, so new services, new strategies together, including, including also people from outside the company. So this is broad. Also the lean enterprise, you might know, is not the boundary of your company. It's the whole value change to the customer. And openness is about how people converse. So it's about knowledge flows. It's about how information can enter your company and, and travel through the company. What we did with Liquido was pushing all these things to the 100%, 100%, 100%, and see what happened. And it worked. For us, it worked. Now we're starting to understand for which kind of companies this can be useful and how to implement, but after four years. Marshall McLuhan, which we introduced at the beginning, speaking about uh, how new media changed the previous ones, used this diagram. It's called Tetrad. He says, like, you know, like the mobile phone with the normal dial, round dial phone or, or the digital television or I mean, anything that has been dis disrupted. What happens is that the new technology amplifies something. So what does a uh, new governance model like Liquido amplify? Well, they amplify anti-fragility. They amplify adaptability. And uh, what uh, does it make obsolete? Unfortunately, it makes obsolete management as a company a structural layer because it opens up management to the whole company in a different way. Um, how does it flip when it pushes to its limits? What is the limit? Well, we have found out that the limit is communication. With an org chart, you have communication lines and reporting lines pretty clear, even though then people usually don't use it exactly as it is. There is a formal and a real system. With a liquid organization, it, the challenge is having the right information and giving the right information to the right people, not to everybody. But what does it make relevant again? It makes relevant again people. So for the first time in history, uh, after the industrial age at, at least, it's not people that have to adapt to the organizational rule structure but we're designing structure that can adapt dynamically over time to the way in which people can create value best. This is what adaptive organization design is all about. So if you imagine an org chart like a picture, we are building something that is going to be a movie. So there is a structure in any moment, but it's liquid in the sense that it changed given the needs of people to create value. Okay? It has a built-in set of principles that allow people to continuously change how they work. And now the formal system at, is, is just displaying the real system. It's not ruling it. So it's like a Copernican revolution. People are back in the center. This is very important because another thing that Marshall McLuhan said is that we become what we behold. We shape our tools and then our tools shape us. You can see how the world has changed after we invented the car. Our cities are designed around the cars. And I'm here because we invented an airplane, okay? So if we invent companies that put people back in the center, life of people, our lives are going to change. Are going to change in a positive way in respect to when we had to adapt to an organizational structure because that, way, that was the way it is, that was the way it was. It can work because it's all about people again after one and a half century being about structures. These are us, we, this is part of the management of my company, and uh, this is what we found out. But still, it is, oh sorry, I'm talking about something you don't see, but I see it. Hopefully it will come. So this is part of what I've learned. We're getting there, but still is not there. Um, there are three things that uh, I think you should take in account in your companies, in your work, and then eventually let us 
to build Liquido and to learn what I want to share with you. But for these three things, we need the slides, so we'll have to wait. Yes. Okay, this is us. <laughs> and we're not that yellow usually. Okay, so besides the structure, the four pillars of Liquido or holacracy, Zappos adopting it, Medium dropping it, and this kind of thing, technical things at the level of tools and processes, what are three things that you should bring to any company in this century? So the first thing is enabling trust. Okay, this is easy to say, but not that easy to do. In practical terms, this means transparency, and meritocracy. It means that if you're hiding something, you should have a very nice reason for hiding something. Otherwise, people will think that you're hiding something because you don't want them to know, okay? And this is completely normal in most companies. We hide something in Cocoon to some people just when it's to preserve our customers. That's the only reason. And people know it and say, okay, I'm fine with that. I don't want to know that things of that customer if I'm not in that project and the customer doesn't want me to know. All the rest is completely transparent and meritocracy as well. Now, we push this to a culture, a culture that we uh, have adopted the word Ohana, which comes from Hawaii. Now, Ohana, who has seen Lilo and Stitch from Disney? No, come on. You missed the masterpiece. You, you really need to watch it. Okay, this is a cartoon from Disney. Ohana means family, and you might see why we haven't used the word family in Italy. So we preferred to use the Hawaiian word, which is amazingly close to the good sense of family we have in Italy, not the one that got famous with some movies. So Ohana means family, and family means nobody gets left behind or forgotten. This is beyond tools and processes. This is culture. We show this every day, and I don't have to give examples of this. Just trust me on that or come and see how it works at our company. This is something you can embrace, and once you embrace a principle, then the principle will generate rules, okay? On dynamic rules. Each group will generate rules according to that principle, and that rules then can die, and new ones can be generated from the same principle. So if you want it less, fancy and more technical, read the book, The Power of Pool, from John Hagel. Actually, what he says is that in order to become, in this networked way of working, in order to become a super node, you need to gain trust. And when you become a super node, either at the individual, institutional, or arena level, okay, this is the same, you can move from the access phase to the attract phase. So now it's easy for us to access any resource. So if you don't find it, it's that you're not looking well enough. People, money, it's quite easy, information, not to say, to access. So what we want is to start attracting. And then we have another problem, which is selecting. So if you become a super node th through trust, then you start attracting. And just attracting today, you can realize your full potential, which is the achieved part, okay? Otherwise, you're out of the right knowledge flows, right, out of the right arenas. And you want the most people possible in your company to become that kind of super nodes, and that's enabled by trust. Second thing that you need to build into your companies is the evolution of the concept of leadership. We connect leadership with positional power. So our leaders are the one at the top of the hierarchy. And when you don't have a fixed hierarchy, but you have a dynamic one, who are the leaders? Are the ones that are leading, simply the ones that have followers. Now, let's reflect to this a little bit. Now, Peter Drucker used to say that most of what we call management consists of making it difficult for people to get their work done. And this is what often happens with a positional leader. This is a research from CB that you might know is a member advisory uh, firm, famous in the world, they have 10,000 clients, including uh, uh, more than 80% of Fortune 500 and more than 70% of the Dow Jones Asian Titans. So they, they have a lot of information. 
And this research said that uh, from 2003 to 2013, more organizations are satisfied with their leaders. This is the percentage of organization that would replace senior leadership team members if given the opportunity. So it's like our directors, if we could, we would change them. And here, leadership is intended as a positional leader, all right? So we don't like our leaders. They are old. They don't know what to do today. OK, but on the other side, same research. Over the past year, senior staff, 80% have been given more responsibility. 76% have been asked to achieve more and broader objectives. 65% must deliver business results faster. Well, it's a, I mean, it's impossible to be satisfied with people to whom, to whom we're asking this. They just cannot cope. This is the end of a marriage. It's the end of a marriage between the firm and their positional leadership. We're asking too much, they cannot do it, and both sides are not happy. It's not just a matter of the employee not happy or the manager's not happy. The thing is that these two sides of the table just doesn't work anymore. So beyond transactional and transformational leadership that we should still need to know how to use, of course, there is a new kind of leadership that you want to build into your companies, which is network leadership. So you need to know how to say, this is what needs to be done, this is the reward, so being trans transactional, helping people growth, being transformational and saying this is to be done because in this way you will become better and we will become better with you, this stays. But you need to also be able to do something more. Network leadership means that leaders must must help others build and connect to networks. So this is about the nodes I was speaking before. Leaders must align and direct the network. This is a new responsibility that all leaders have, not positional leaders. So this is you in your company, wherever you work in your company. You need to help others to connect and help them align and direct the network and energize and enable the network. So give them resources, purpose, Feedback. Once again, Peter Drucker used to say that your first and foremost job as a leader is to take charge of your own energy and then help to orchestrate the energy of those around you. And again, this is from the 80s. Okay, well, he had a quite long sight, but this is human. This is why it was known. All the rest were mechanistic. This is human. We need to help people connect. Now, third and last thing that we have learned and we've been he hearing about it in the keynotes, you need to disable fear. Now, what does that mean? Well, in our opinion, three things. So the first thing is you have to set up an environment where people can jump, where they can try experiments, okay? But this is easy and not enough. You need to give them shoes so they don't hurt themselves when they jump. And you would like also like to probably have a look of what is down the water before they jump. So telling people you can experiment, no problem, go ahead, is not enough. You need to provide tools, processes, boxes, resources in which they can truly experiment. One of the things that we keep finding is that now nowadays all the companies want to do lean startup entrepreneurship, but then they actually don't want to do it in practical terms because they don't give the freedom, the authority, the resources, and the rewards for trying. Not just the rewards for succeeding, that's easy. So you need to do this if you want to start disabling fear. Then you need to build a culture and commit yourself to continuous improvement. In lean thinking, this is called Kaizen. It, it's often translated with continuous improvement. It literally means change for the best. Here the concept is that perfection doesn't exist. It is a direction. It is not a goal, okay? So if you commit to this, you know that the important thing is that tomorrow you're a little better than yesterday. Nobody will judge you by defect to what you should be. We will judge you, if ever, by the increase, increasement you have done in respect to what you were the last month or the last year. 
And this is continuous for all of us. Third and last thing, in order to disable fear, you have to create a unique body. And this was, this is an example of stigma in nature. Here you have a, a big fish, a predator, and this is behaving as a single body. And for this, you need different organizational model. And of course, you need a different culture. When you find yourself in a body, unique body, with the people you work with, your fear starts fading away. Now, this is not just about tools and processes, and this is the thing that we have learned and I want to share with you. This is about empathy. This is about caring for others. It's about generosity of the work. And in a word, this is about love. And again, for the second time today, you hear weird business words. So we are seeing a shift in humankind, in mankind, from ego-driven systems to eco-driven systems. We are getting um, more and more aware that actually we are one. And being one means that what happens to one company is a problem or a benefit to all the others. What happened to one person is a matter of the happiness of all the other person in the company. This is really deep, and it is so true, because if we, today in the economy, if you think uh, about the arena level, if we have a problem in economy in Japan or in India, there is no country in the world that can just walk away and don't care about it. We are strongly connected. Complexity made us one. So now this new awareness, is allowing us to focus on what is, in my opinion, the opposite of fear, which is love, interconnection. This is why we work like this when we collaborate, and this is not new here, but it's very new in some other companies. This is why we converse like, like this, and this is why we co-create like this. These are more human things, are 3D, touchy conversations, we are also a distributed company. We travel to get together, okay? We care about each other, simply. We know that if somebody has a problem, is unhappy, deeply unhappy, it's a problem that we all have, not just inside of the company. Again, we have clients that entered our governance. We are partners that entered our governance. This uh, idea of the boundaries that rule the distance we have to care about is dead. There is no boundary. There are value streams. More than one, we should try to be part of. Now, let me close this. Marshall McLuhan said that our uh, age of anxiety is in grand part the result of trying to do today's job with yesterday's tools and yesterday's concepts. So this is why we had to change our company. We devised the liquid organization. We entered this conversation. We are here today. There is a change going on in, in, in between two generations. I've been working with a board, I've been part of the board of the European Organization Design Forum, I've been working with people that have designed organization for 40 years. We absolutely need their knowledge to learn how to do it today. And I've worked with amazing people that were asking us how to implement an agile governance while they have 40 years of experience in designing companies. This is a unique and beautiful moment in history. It is needed in order to serve complexity, you cannot control complexity, but you can serve it. You can make the most out of it, and you can enjoy the ride on the, on the way. We just need to learn. So let's make it happen, and this is what I've learned. Thank you very much. Ten minutes. Very nice question. So the question is, uh, so you're distributed. How does culture flourish? How do you build that? Hasn't it become a, a bottleneck? Yes, actually, well, not a bottleneck, but it's the, our, it has been our main focus from the beginning. I believe, I will speak about it in the other talk, actually, on Friday, on Tuesday, on Thursday. So I believe that a human system has at least four levels, tools and processes, and it is where we normally focus. Then we have competencies needed for that. These competencies have a culture layer. 
culture is what a human system does or doesn't do. It's not what we say, it's, not, it's what we do. And then there are people, the foundation of all this. So if you work at the tools and process and you say, okay, this is Liquido, now let's work like that, it will not change anything. What we believe and what we bring to our customers is that if you introduce a good tool, it might be a Kanban board, it might be a retrospective meeting tool. If you introduce a good tool, simple one, they can adopt without too much effort, it's like a Trojan horse that will bring new cultural principles. And those principles will start to spread in everything they do. And then they're ready for the next step. So this is what we have done in Cocoon when we founded the company. We introduced new tools, starting actually with a Kanban board and then building Liquid on top of that. And we focused, before thinking about scaling up our company, with, which we haven't done yet, it's organically growing, we focused on creating the right culture. So we made sure that people understood the tools, had time to share their thoughts and change the tools and made their, their, their own. In this way, culture grows naturally. So uh, simple but very uh, disruptive principles, like you can see whatever is going on in the governance. And you can propose an activity as any other, other people, because maybe you need something in your work, propose it in the governance. And you can take part to governance activities. So it's, oh, oh, really? This builds culture. Not the tool, but the, the fact that they change the way they behave on a daily basis. They start building new competencies. We have found out that people entering such a system were lost. Say, I need somebody that tells me what to do, because they were used to having company telling what they do. And we say, here, here you can stay sitting down for the whole year. Nobody will tell you, hey, you have to do this. But you can ask anybody. You can activate and try whatever you want. And of course, if we see you sitting, we will come and say, is everything fine? But if you say yes, we'll go away and say, OK, I'll go working. So these new things started building a culture. And then, of course, we built on that momentum. We have rituals. We come together twice per year for three days. We have uh, one weekly call. We have monthly catch-up. So you need, to have, you need to create space for conversations. So it's a principle from Harrison Owen, uh, open space technology creator. So once you open space, things happen. If you don't create that space, they don't. Thank you. I have a question here. So, uh, yeah. So you talked about um, building yesterday's con I mean, building based on yesterday's concepts and tools. But when you're trying to build something new, so what leadership qualities or characteristics y you will help to build this? Because not everybody going to jump onto something. You say, "Hey, that's a great idea. Let's do it." Because you don't know what the idea is. So what, what do you think the leader should possess in this case? What do you, I think the leadership skills? Leadership skills, or leadership characteristics. What do you, how do oh. we drive this? I mean, now, even though it's not top down, but still somebody needs to kind of bring up the concept and uh, evolve it over a period. So what, what, what managers do here in this case? Okay. Or leaders do in this case? Yeah, leaders better than managers. I mean, we. Managers are everybody for us, so we all manage. We don't need a manager layer. So what should we do in order to enable this? Sorry? Yeah. Okay, so if we talk about leader as I intend a leader, so anybody, regardless of their height in the company, it's as simple the, the three things that I told you. So, okay, you, you need to disable fear, you need to enable trust, those things that we said, okay? But um, the most important one that I would say is, again, is love. So, and this is the easy answer, huh? then I'll give you the, the different, difficult one. So once people have a culture of caring for the others, they will just enable what is good for the other. So there is a very big difference in seeing the things from your perspective and trying to see things from the perspective of the other. It's that simple. 
So once within a team, or also among teams, people start to really caring what they need to work better, then different things start to happen, okay? So this is the basic thing. You need to evolve leadership in that direction, in, as a, a really enabling people in their growth. Whatever we mean by growth, we all look for that. So it might be more, more money side, more competencies side, more reputation side. All of us have different idea, but we're looking for growth. So if you, I understand what you need for your next growth step, I will help you significantly. Otherwise, I will just show that I want to help, but nothing changes. This is the easy answer. Then the R answer is that we have seen over and over in time agile operations crashing towards rigid management. And that's the kind of leadership we normally question when we say we are striving to be agile because they ask us to as well. So the leadership wants an agile development for the software, but then they want a Gantt chart with a budget for the, last, for the next four years and uh, to ensure what is going to come out. So this is the problem, and this is exactly why we have built Liquido. So once the governance becomes agile, but you have to change the system, how you, you manage things. Once that becomes agile, then you have the same culture at all the levels. Actually, you don't have the levels anymore. You have different competencies, different focus, which is different. But might also be the same person working in two different processes of the company. So it's no longer role-based, it's process-based, it's competencies-based. How do you do that? Some companies will never do that. Let's say it as it is. Some companies have a different culture. We found three uh, cultural characteristics you should look for in order to understand if that's doable in that company or not. So the first one is they need to be value flow driven. That company needs to be there to create value. So if that's the case, they will listen to new ways of creating value. And they eventually, if you're good proposing the smallest thing that will change them, not the biggest change, of course, they will start changing. Second thing, they need to be complexity aware. So they don't need to be, if they are a company that tries to control reality and have reality follow their plan, there's nothing you can do about it un unless that changes over time because probably they're crashing, which is a thing that is happening a lot. A company coming to us say, I, we don't know what to do, performance is going down. Yeah, I bet it, because you're working like it, it was meant to be in the 60s, not today. Third, third thing, they need to be evolution oriented. Now, there are, so they don't want to preserve the status quo, they want to grow. Now, there are very good managers from the old school that have been taught to Gantt plan reality, but they have these three characteristics. In that case, they're suitable for being a leadership that enable all that you're asking for, but you have to tell them how to do it. And our way is introducing a little tool. I've been working, and then I I'll wrap it up, I've been working in a big project with European Commission, and it was traditionally managed, as you can imagine. So I was, I was called for uh, li like a pivot point between technology, management, and stakeholders, which is a very nice position to say, OK, this is how I work. I introduced a Kanban board. There were seven teams doing the same thing without speaking to each other. I said, whatever is not on this board doesn't exist to me. I don't want to talk about it. So I can update it. I will do it for you, OK? I don't want you to change your way of work, but this is how it is for me. This is how I can provide my best value. So I introduced this small tool. Well, after two, well, of course, nobody wanted to use it. I had to update it. After two months that people saw the difference in having that small change, I entered the project officer room, and there was a Kanban board on his wall. I didn't have to say anything. I just looked at him, and he said, well, I like the way you were working. I want to introduce this. So things started to change. But that's because that person had these three characteristics. He just didn't know how to do it. Thank you, due to possible. Sorry, I think I'm over time. No, Thank no, you very no, much. No. Thank you. Thank you.